Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'm going to be answering a question about the problem of suffering. The uh, general version of that being uh, how can God exist if there's, you know, how can God exist and be infinitely good and infinitely powerful if there is suffering in the world? Um, this is not a version of that question, but rather a uh, fairly specific sort of sub-question to it. It comes from Gdowskar. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And, um, and so he asked, uh, my question would be regarding the problem of evil, uh, would be triggered by my own personal experience and be fairly narrow and be an inquiry into how God can allow for such rampant depression among society. I wholeheartedly believe God exists with my intellect. There's no doubt in my mind that he exists. However, because I suffer with depression to the point of being suicidal at times, I have difficulty on an emotional and spiritual level believing that God loves me. How would you answer this? So, um, there's an intellectual side to this question, but I don't think, um, because Gadaskar said that he you know, fully believes in God, that it's really the intellectual um, aspect to it that's the main question. At the end of the video, I'm going to, um, I'm going to address that just in case other people have questions with that. But I want to get to the, the main part of this question first. And so, um, the, uh, the question of depression. So th there's sort of two things to look at within this. And there's the question of depression and what exactly is depression? Because there, there's a tendency to think of depression within our society at present as just a chemical imbalance in the same way that like missing a limb is just a, you know, the, in a raw physics sort of chemical sense, they're not being part of your limb there. So if some, you know, an alligator bites your leg off, it is chemically missing in the sense of there aren't the chemicals there that actually constitute your leg. Um, that's one interpretation of depression. It is not in general, by the way, something that has ever been clinically proved. In fact, depression is virtually guaranteedly actually a thing with many different causes that all just sort of present with similar symptoms. Um, so really getting into depression is probably beyond, I mean, it's beyond the scope really of a single video. Um, and by the way, I don't mean to say there can't be such a thing as depression caused by some sort of chemical defect in the brain. Um, I just want to give that little caveat. But so there's that, and there are kinds of depression, and I'm here I'm just very briefly sketching out an aspect of this. So there's if depression is caused simply by a chemical imbalance in the brain, the brain is just doing something wrong such that it cannot function correctly and depression is the outcome. This becomes a cross to bear much like if an alligator had bitten off your leg. It's just a thing that has happened to you that you suffer from and so you can either, you may possibly be able to fix it with other chemicals. Um, although in general the success of that tends to be, from what I understand, very iffy works occasionally uh, for a lot of people it doesn't or works for a while for a lot of people but then tends not to and so on um but that's just on a case-by-case -case basis you fix that if you can and if you can't it's a cross to bear and so that will come to suffering which i will address sort of more generally later there's also depression um which is essentially having some sort of really big problem in your life um, whether it's some sort of major stressor, you're afraid of something that's going to, to be devastating, um, or, uh, you know, you've just lost a loved one, or any number of things. You've got a massive problem in your life, and depression is, roughly speaking, the mind focusing on this problem to an extent of excluding everything else. And as such, this is, rather than a chemical imbalance, essentially a maladaptive, um, a, a maladaptive strategy for doing something that actually is useful. And so in that sort of case, um, where depression is that, then the thing to do is to, to, to deal with the depression, of course, is to focus on actually fixing, to, to take steps to actually fix the problem. Um, this is where depression can become so crippling that it, it becomes counterproductive. This is where it becomes a maladaptive coping mechanism. But in this case, depression is very different than just a cross to bear. It's a cross to bear and also a job to do. And the, the cross to bear is sort of getting in the way of the job. And so this is where techniques for alleviating the problem enough that you can deal with the underlying problem um, becomes really the thing to do. And this is a fairly different thing because allowing that sort of thing, that sort of depression, where you are um, essentially dealing 
in you're dealing in a suboptimal way with a problem that you need to fix is categorically different simply than, than like your brain simply malfunctioning. And so this sort of depression um, is, I, I think, it, there are two things. One, you frequently will need some sort of alleviation of symptoms. And this is where psychotropic medication actually often comes in handy. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm not speaking clinically. There's a, there's a wide... A, there's a wide array of people and a wide array of things that work, but amongst the practice of psychotherapy and um, and psychiatry is using uh, certain types of chemicals, um, I think, but I'm not sure. Uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, are in this class that basically like kill all your emotions, so you don't feel sad, you don't feel happy, you don't really feel much of anything. Not a great way to live, it's not a long-term solution, but it can fix the problem of your depression causing you to not even do anything. And then that enables you at least to go and address the problem. Once you fix that problem, you can get off of the medications that more or less kill like all of your emotions. And then you will have escaped the depression because your problem is now taken care of. Um, so that sort of thing in the question of, you know, how does God allow that sort of thing? And remember, whenever we talk about suffering and how does God allow it, God has an astonishing number of purposes. Um, I really should have put this disclaimer at the beginning, I apologize. But God has, in all things, a, a number of purposes beyond our comprehension. Because for everything that God permits to happen, God actually sees all of the effects of this action to everything through all of history. So, you know, if I, I pick up my cell phone and put it down again, what does that do? I don't know. I mean, some number of people will see it. It may impact somebody in some way such that somebody will do something different that then results in other people doing different things. And, you know, the chaos theory, the butterfly flaps its wings and six months later there's a storm in a city across the world type of thing. We have no idea, but God does. God does, in fact, see all of that. And so for everything that God permits to happen, God is seeing all of the effects through all of time. And every single effect of the thing that God permits is part of God's intention. It's not that God has like a main intention and didn't foresee the rest. God sees all of them simultaneously. And so in everything that happens, every effect of it is part of God's purpose or purposes is perhaps a better way of putting it. And so whenever we talk about what is God's purpose in something, bear in mind that like we are seeing a purpose. We're talking like about a fiber in an entire garment. And you know, when we can trace one of the thread uh, of the fibers that goes into making a thread, that goes into making the loop, that goes into making the fabric, we have a very limited view. And and it is profitable to talk about this as long as we keep that very limited view in mind. Um, and don't like the comforters of Job pretend to be actually explaining the mind of God to anyone. So, um, the comfort is Job from the book of Job, if you don't catch the reference. So, um, the explanation here for that kind of depression, um, the kind where you need to deal with some sort of problem, and it may be an ongoing problem. I, the one time in my life I was ever depressed, I was unemployed. Um, I just, just left grad school, it took me 11 months to find a job, and I was depressed, and you know, you know, including you know the standard things like I, I wasn't answering the phone. I was, um, I was making a whole host of bad decisions that were all, they, they had as their unifying thread essentially that I just couldn't deal with anything, and um, and this was a case of that kind of depression. I, I had a particular problem. Once I had a job, that went away because now I didn't have that problem, so I didn't have this. You know, I didn't feel this deep-seated need to focus exclusively on this problem, to deal with absolutely nothing other than this problem. So I've experienced that kind of depression. Never never took any psychotropic chemicals for it. I was able to muddle through a bit, uh, you know, depended in part on the, the kindness of, uh, of relatives to help get me through, um, you know, like actually making rent payments. I literally lent the money to, to make rent payments and was, you know, eating cheaply and building up credit card debt and... It was an unsustainable situation, and I was kind of spiraling in it, except I was also at least managing to look for a job, and by good fortune, and you know, from my perspective, sheer luck, found one. And, um, and then 
that fixed the problem. I mean, I had to pay off the debt, and there are various, I had to repair a bunch of things that came from the bad decisions that I made, but at this point, the major problem in my life went away, and so I was able to deal with everything. So I've experienced that kind of depression. Um, and, and so that that one, you know, wasn't for all that long in my life, etc. I'm not, I'm not trying to claim to be intimately familiar with everybody's depression. Just saying I can testify firsthand that kind of depression does in fact exist. The, um, for that kind of depression, why does God permit this sort of thing to happen? To some degree, this is just us dealing with it, ver dealing with something that we can handle very badly. And I can speak, at least in my own personal experience, many of the bad decisions I made while I was feeling depressed about being unemployed back when was... I mean, I was culpable for them. I could have chosen otherwise. It would have been hard, but it nonetheless was within my power. And so, to, in part there, for that kind of depression, part of the answer is that God permits it because he gives us free will. Um, and now, it should be noted that through the kindness of friends and relatives and so on, I was not permitted to make as much of a disaster of my life as I would have done on my own. So... Um, so, so the sort of the big thing to see there, and because the, this always comes up within the problem of suffering, of okay, God permits free will, and free will has to actually have some effect. You have to actually be able to make bad choices that have an effect to have free will. But then, so often comes up, well, why does God, you know, permit our, our you know, decisions to have such terrible effects? Look at, you know, the Holocaust. No one ever brings up the Holocaust no more, but you know, you could, um, and so on. And the answer of course, is that it varies with the particulars, you know, when it comes to life and death. Um, we don't know how long each person is supposed to have been given um, to live. And in some sense, while it does seem like a person must necessarily be able to cause another to be allotted less of life, you know, on this side of death, you know, everyone gets the same amount of eternity, that is infinitely much of it, um, but, you know, how long are we meant to be alive here? I mean, there are lots of people who die before their mothers even know they were pregnant with them, where they, you know, live for a few hours or a few days before dying, and their mothers never even knew that they had a child. Um, there, there are children who, you know, die before they're ever born, you know, where the mothers know. This, you know, they're both miscarriages, but the only ones that get called miscarriages is the one where someone knows them. So many people are allotted minutes, hours, days, months of life. Um... And that's it. And so um, we don't know how, for any given person how much life they really were supposed to be allotted such that um, when their life comes to an end, even though it was, you know, in the case of a murder, clearly the, per the person is morally culpable for the action of murder. However, we don't know that the person in question was really supposed to have a longer life. And whether or not the person who committed the murder was merely permitted to serve God's purposes in a different way. Because, of course, everybody does the will of God. They just, the big question is, do you do it intentionally or accidentally? Are you cooperating with God? And this is a virtuous action. Or are you fighting against God, but, like, well, you know, God's going to win. And so, um, this is, it's a difficult sort of thing. And bear in mind, I'm not saying that God wants a person to murder somebody, but rather that if the amount of, of life that God had decided, chosen, whatever you want to call it, to give to a person it, as that free gift of bringing the person to existence and maintaining their existence and so on. And then uh, remember, because this life, this changeable life in time is the, um, is the bringing about of being whose purpose is then to exist eternally in eternity with God. This is a temporary life. It's intrinsically temporary. And so how long is this intrinsically temporary portion of life that each person is given is something that we as human beings don't know. But we can, and this is where you know, the answer always becomes trust God, we can trust God that the amount of, that even where somebody through an evil action is ending somebody else's life, for example, you just, I'm using that example because it's the extreme one that people love to bring up, that we still trust that God has orchestrated things such that this serves his good purpose, that the, the amount of life that he had given to the person was sufficient for what God had wanted to give to that person. And this sort of actually brings me 
to the other portion of that question about how can I know that God loves me, or, you know, I can't feel that God loves me and, and it puts me in a bad spiritual place that I can't believe in, like, that practical sense that God loves me. And the connection between these two things is that all of life is that free gift from God. God calls us out of nothing. I, I'm not literally. God um, infuses of us with being to call somebody out of nothing though it sounds poetic is a slightly incorrect metaphor there because we didn't sort of exist separately from god that god could you know then interact with us prior to our existence but god makes us out of nothing in order to give more to us so and this is going to sound like a dry intellectual answer but the really easy simple way you can tell that god loves you is the fact that you exist you only exist because God loves you. The act of existence that you are partaking in is God's gift to you. God's free gift to you out of generosity. God is loving you into existence. And so the point is, in, in I mean, I know this is, sounds like a pat intellectual answer, but it actually is kind of the most important part of this. How can you tell that God loves you? Well, you're there. You, you're only there because God loves you, therefore, God loves you. It, it, logically, it, you could not exist without God loving you, and so you know that God loves you. Now, this is where we come... There's a problem here. This is where we come to where everybody should read the book The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis. Really good book. Um, I, I was glancing over at my bookshelf over there <laughs> where I happen to have it. I always do that. Whenever I mention a book, I instinctively look at it or point to it. Anyway, the... Um, <clears throat> Point being, in, in The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis points out that in English we only have the word love, and we mean a, a wide variety of things by it. In Greek they actually had four words for love that they distinguished, that we cover by love in all of these things. Um, and these were agape, philos, eros, and storge. Agape, the love of God, generous love, also translated, uh, the, in Latin it becomes charitas, from which we get the, Latin, the English charity, Although these days we tend to think of charity actually as an organization rather than as an act of love. But that's agape. I'm going to get more on that one because that one's the most important one here. Um, philos, the love of friends. Uh, this is where two or more people love something together. And in loving that thing together, whether it be, you know, football or fishing or woodworking or whatever, um, you know, the, the green grass, the mountains, the fresh air sunshine, whatever it is. In loving this thing together, the two are capable of helping each other to love it more. And this thing whereby two people come together in loving, in appreciating the good of some third thing and help each other in the appreciation of that good. They give to each other um, this appreciation. Eros, um, uh, erotic love, or the, the love of husband and wife. This is um, the love that draws two people together to take the most direct um, analogy you find to God within creation, and that is where two, uh, a male and a female, come together and together make a new person such that they can then give a whole heck of a lot more to that person. Um, you, you see very directly um, in, you know, when the child is then born and then the parents feed it, the parents care for it. And it's very directly analogous to the love of God because at that point the child can't do anything to deserve any of that. I'm going to get to the deserving it more in a moment. But that's Eros. Eros is that particular sort of love whereby two people who are physically compatible come together and take part in the act of creation with God in this fashion. Um, it also involves the, the direct appreciation of, of the good in the other. Um, as C.S. Lewis mentioned, the, the uh, position of lovers and the sense of Eros is face to face and friends side by side. That the, the two friends look at some other good and the two lovers look at the good in each other and then um, bring, you know, yeah, from that bring forth new life. And then uh, Storge is the love of the familiar, or the love of the family. And this is the sort of love of things that are around us, the, the care of the things that we take care of because they are there. Um, that thing wherein you love something because it's yours, in the sense of not of ownership, not of possession, not of the right, C.S. Lewis said, uh, you know, because uh, this teddy bear belongs to the child in the sense of this is the teddy bear that the child has the right to rip you know, rip the arms off and take out the stuffing of, but there's, it's yours in the sense of this is the one that has been given to you to take care of because it's there. 
Um, this is deeply tied, by the way, to the, the Christian concept of the neighbor. Uh, your neighbor are your neighbors are the people who have been given to you to do something for. Um, the fascinating thing within I, I won't go uh, speak on this long, but um, if you look in and think, what is the, the two greatest commandments? Christ was asked to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And the second commandment is like unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. And then the um, the the lawyer who asked Christ this then because he wished to be justified said, justified, said, and who is my neighbor? And what's fascinating is Christ didn't really answer that question. He did, in one sense, but very indirectly. He then told the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the man who was walking along on a journey. There's a man who was waylaid by bandits and injured on the side of the road, left for dead, and there's several people who walked by. And then there's a Samaritan, um, and if you don't know the context, the Samaritans were... Um, the, this, uh, they were Jews who intermarried with pagans and didn't just intermarry, but merged their religions syncretically with the pagan religions. And so they were unfaithful to God. Uh, so this is something very important you have to remember. They were, th this was not a like, oh, they've got a, you know, they're, they're, their skin is lighter than mine or their skin is darker than mine or their nose is bigger or their nose is smaller or their hair is curlier or their hair is less curly. It wasn't a physical sort of thing. It wasn't racial in that sense. It was these people had adulterated the prop, the true religion given to us by God with pagan religion. They, they were syncretic about it. And so this is why the Samaritans were such outcasts. Um, because they were turning away, they partially turned away from God to adulterate the true worship of God with the, the worship of pagan deities. Very, very important to remember this about the the um, the Samaritans. The Samaritans really did bad things. These are not um, when we talk when in the parable of the the Good Samaritan. Um, this would be like, you know, somebody, to, to bring it into sort of a modern context, this would be a bit like somebody coming from a culture in which they routinely practiced child marriage. Or, you know, where it was normal for them to uh, do something that we find morally repugnant. So, you know, if somebody came from a culture in which it was, you know, rape was legal, or somebody came from a culture in which child abuse was entirely normal, something like this, um, that we would look at that culture as horrific, not because, oh, they don't look like us or they speak a little different than us, but they are doing very, very bad things and this is in their culture. So uh, that's the thing you have to remember. When the Samaritan came along, this is not like, um, you know, this is not like setting something in the 1950s about some white people and a black person or, or something like that. This is nothing like that. This is more along the lines of set it in like the late 1930s, early 1940s, and we're talking about an SS guard walks by. That's a lot more like what the Samaritan would be like in terms of his, his relationship to everybody. So um, bear that in mind about the, the lesson of the Good Samaritan. And this is all relevant though. I know this may seem like a digression, but it's actually very relevant because the Samaritan this person from this awful culture comes, he takes pity on this man, uh, on the Jew who was beaten on the ground, you know, left for dead on the ground. Several other Jews had passed this Jew who was beaten on the ground. And there's, you know, people, this is part of their society. These are the same group of people. These are people who had a responsibility, a natural responsibility because he was part of their extended family, essentially. And they passed him by. But here was somebody who was not from the extended family and moreover was from this really horrible group of people who did be horrible because they they did bad things, who took pity on the man. And he picked him up and put him on his animal and took him to an inn. And, you know, and he dressed his wounds and he had to go about his business, but he gave money to the innkeeper saying, here, care for this man on my behalf. And when I come back, if it costs you more than the amount that I gave you here to care for him, I'll make good your losses. And so, this is a man who is not, in, in the um, conventional sense of the word these days, a good man. In the same way you would not send, say that somebody who was a member of the, you know, the German SS was a good man. He was not a good person in that sense. And yet, he went, he took pity on this man, and took care of him. And Christ didn't, did not say, well, it's very interesting, he did not say, who was this man's neighbor? He said, 
which of these was neighbor to this man? And the answer, of course, was the Samaritan. Now, what's really kind of, what's especially fascinating is that Jesus turned being a neighbor into a verb. It wasn't a state of being. It wasn't this group of people are neighbors. It was who was neighbor to this man. And this is the thing um, about neighbors and about loving neighbors is that this is an action. To love your neighbor is therefore an action. It's a thing to do. It is a thing, in some sense, it is a thing to be, but in a temporary sense. And so, again, it, the other thing uh, kind of that's relevant here, because um, that's the, the love of family, that's taking care of people just because they're around you, just because these are the people here. But these things all partake in that love of God. Because what was he doing there? Because, I mean, what the heck did the, the man who was beaten, bleeding on the side of the road, and probably not even conscious, what on earth did he deserve of the Samaritan who was passing him by? He didn't deserve anything. But the Samaritan simply took pity on him. The Samaritan could give to him, and therefore he did give to him. And in doing so, in taking pity on the man, he did, he partook of the love of God. And the love of God has nothing to do whatsoever with deserving. The love of God is all about, if I can give, I give because I have in me to give. God, who is completely full, has is you know, utterly full and thus utterly completely able to give, and moreover, can't even receive. What we tend to think of when we talk about being worthy of love is not being worthy of love. What we talk about when we talk about being worthy of love is really being worthy of a reciprocal relationship. And recipro there's nothing wrong with reciprocal relationships. You know, and it, you know, we have plenty of reciprocal relationships all day long and they're actually, you know, they're, they're good things. Like I go to the grocery store and we have the reciprocal relationship of I give them money and they give me food. You know, I pick out which food I want ahead of time, but then I say like, okay, here's the money for this food. And I leave with the food, and they stay there with the money. And this is a reciprocal relationship. And I am worthy of this reciprocal relationship because I have money. And they're worthy of this reciprocal relationship because they have food. And that's what makes us worthy of this. It's, you know, really, really simple. But that's what that means to be worthy of it in that sense. To be worthy of this reciprocal relationship is just... We have things to exchange with each other. There's some minor other details, because if I was a homicidal maniac, then they probably wouldn't let me in the store because it would be too dangerous. And there's some minor things along those lines, wherein even though you have the um, necessary things to trade with somebody in these reciprocal relationships that we have with people, um, you may be so dangerous in some ancillary sense that they still won't engage in this trade with you simply because you're too dangerous in some way or other. Um, they, it can, the danger can be a little bit more subtle than that. But um, these days, the, the way society tends to work, where most people interact with complete strangers that we only see for short periods of our life and then never see again anyway. Um, I mean, even if, it, you know, at, at the grocery store, even if somebody works there for 20 years, and, you know, I see them at the grocery store, that's mostly just it. And so we don't really care about much of anything else. Like, if, if the person at the grocery store is the sort of person that you should never, um, you know, that you should never lend something to because he'll never give it back. What do I care? I'm not going to lend him anything. He just works at the grocery store. I don't have that kind of relationship with him. Similarly, if I, the customer, somebody who comes in, and I'm the sort of person that you should never ask to, um, you know, to, to do you a favor because I will always forget to do it. So what? They're not going to ask me for any favors. Most of life doesn't have that, and so our reciprocal relationships tend to be very bare. In family members, it's a little bit more complex, because amongst family members, we do tend to do things like that, like ask for favors and, and other things along those lines. And so in those circumstances, um, when you're dealing with people you actually see and interact with on a fairly regular basis, reciprocal relationships have not just you know, things of roughly equal value to trade, but a bunch of ancillary things that I can trust you to, you know, I, I can trust you to keep a secret, that I can reasonably rely on when you say you're going to do something that you're actually going to do it. You know, I mean, obviously, it, we all have things where things come up and we can't 
fulfill an action. I, I tried to return the book to the library to you, but the library turns out to be closed. Like, you know, that, that doesn't, that's not a problem. So, um, we are preconditioned by our instincts and a lot of habituation to think of worthiness, um, or to think this sort of thing, to be worthy of these sorts of, re of intimate reciprocal relationships as being really, really important. And in a practical sense, it very much is. You need to be a person that other people can trust or you're gonna have a lot of problems in life. And so it is, in fact, important to be the sort of person other people can trust in this sort of sense. And there various ways of trust and so on. Like, you know, if you're working, you need to be the sort of person where if you're given a task to do and you don't object, like, I don't know how to do this or what have you, that you actually will get the task done. Um, these sorts of things, being worthy in that more extended sense of, of basically not being disqualified from a reciprocal relationship, feels very important to us because it is very necessary to do in human relationships. You do have to actually not be dangerous to the people around you in order to be able to live in society. Whether you're physically dangerous or morally dangerous or just uh, dangerous in the sense of people can't rely upon you and so all sorts of things will go wrong if they try, etc. You, you do have to be worthy of having reciprocal relationships. None of that applies to God. And I went into this in some detail precisely because I want to lay bare the nature of what that is. That is all stuff pertaining to human... That is the preconditions to have a reciprocal relationship that enables you to give and get from other people in a trading sort of fashion. It is very important when dealing with people. It is utterly and completely irrelevant when dealing with God. It has nothing whatever to do with our relationship with God. Because we can't hurt God. God is completely sufficient unto himself. God made us not using any raw materials, not using anything that pre-existed, but simply out of God's own creative power, God made us. It's uh, kind of analogous to the way an author um, makes a character. That they, they doesn't start with any stuff. He doesn't start with matter somewhere. It, it, it will break down if you push it, because where does an author get ideas? Because we're finite and we have senses, etc., etc. Okay, but um, the, uh, if you don't push it too far, the analogy actually holds really well. Because if you imagine a character, it's not like you need it, you received the character from something else. Um, it is possible to take inspiration, etc. But like your actual imagining of the character does not in a... In a um, I'm not going to get into the Aristotelian causal causality, especially in part because I always forget the words. It's the efficient causation. Um, but uh, in any event, um, you, you don't need some other power in order to create this character in your mind. In like way, it's a bit like God is imagining us. God creates us not using anything but out of nothing, from nothing. But not in the sense of there is nothing and then we somehow come out of it, but rather simply there is no prior relationship. God, out of the fullness of himself with nothing else, creates us. And there is nothing we can do to hurt God, because God is completely full. God purely gives to us. And so, this is where we come really to, to the full conclusion, that being worthy of God's love is a completely irrelevant thing. It is in no way possible to be worthy of God's love. It is also 100% irrelevant to be worthy of God's love, because there are no preconditions to God's love. Um... As I, I mentioned to uh, um, a friend of mine when he brought it up in a, a different context, he was talking to some other person, um, but mentioned uh, knowing someone who ha um, had trouble feeling worthy of unconditional love, and pointed out, well, that's a contradiction in terms. If you could be worthy, if being worthy of it in any way mattered, it wouldn't be unconditional. It would be conditional on you being worthy. The whole thing that makes it unconditional is it doesn't matter whether or not you're worthy of it. The whole point of unconditional love and the whole nature of God's love is God is unconditional because there can't be conditions, is that God loves us. God fills us up with being so that we may exist and so that God may give to us even more. It has nothing to do with us having something that we can bring to this. God has the stuff that he brings to it and then he's giving it to us so that we can have it. There are things that we can do, um, in particular, and this is where we do have to cooperate, um, not in our sheer existence, that we don't have to cooperate in, because 
you have to exist before you can do anything. But um, what God also does is God gives it to us to be his goodness to other people. So, uh, you know, somebody's hungry and you give them food, you are being God's act of feeding that person. And so you are taking part in God's maintenance of the being of that person here. And so it is given to you to be part of God's act of creation of that person. You have to cooperate with God here in order to receive this, because though God is giving it to you, you can choose not to pass it on. And if you have not given this thing that you have been given, you have not received the gift of this giving. You have not received, you have not accepted the gift of being able to love in this fashion. So um, you can be, in a metaphorical sense, said to be worthy uh, of God's gift in that sense. It's a fairly misleading sense, but you will kind of see this where people talk about being worthy in that sense of um, that if you don't accept the gift that God gives you, well, then you don't have it. Um, it's, however, not a relevant question whether or not you're already worthy. Because this is kind of the other thing, and this is uh, very important about it, that the gift always precedes the worthiness for the gift. It's the, the nature of it. And this is true even, uh, for the most part, in human giving. So, um, unless you're talking about worthiness in the sense of, of being safe to interact with for reciprocal exchanges, there's that. But the, the other sense of, can you actually take advantage of this gift? Are you worthy of it in the sense of it having been given to you, you can then give it to others or you know, in some fashion or other. So for example, if somebody gives you a set of wonderful paint brushes and the most beautiful paints and, and an amazing palette and the world's finest canvas, you are worthy of this gift if you then use them to paint something astonishingly beautiful. If you just do something that anybody could do with crayons on you know, on, on, you know, bad paper, then you have failed to be worthy of the gift because you have not given something commensurate with what you have been given. This sort of worthiness, which is the, the other meaning of are you worthy of it, the thing is this sort of worthiness always follows the gift. You cannot be worthy of this before you have been given the gift because that would be saying that you could, that you have to be worthy of the paint brushes and the paint and the palette and the canvas to be worthy of it is to have painted something commensurate with the excellence of these materials. To be worthy of it before you've given this will have been to have painted all of the, to paint something that good without the materials. In which case, there's no purpose to the gift because you already have that excellence. Um, in a similar way, suppose you have a, um, an amazing sword master, the best swordsman in the land. And the, you know, the best blacksmith in the land makes for him the greatest sword that has ever been made. If that swordsman is no better with the greatest sword that has ever been, the greatest sword that has ever been made than he was with his previous sword, well, then the sword didn't do him any good. There's no value in this magnificent sword that was given to him over the lesser sword. He is only worthy of it if he does more with this great, this wonderful sword, this, this sword of, of tremendous excellence, than he did with his mediocre sword. Again, he can't possibly, intrinsically, he cannot possibly be worthy of the gift in the sense of giving in the full amount of what he has been given until he has received that thing first. And so the only actually practical question, you know, that you can ask if you're worthy in this, uh, of dealing, you know, being loved by people in the sense of love that's purely an, you know, a self-interested exchange, um, in the sense of, essentially, am I sufficiently safe to interact with? That's a relevant question, but that really has nothing to do with anything you've been given by God, except in a very indirect thing and heavily filtered through it being a fallen world. You can ask, am I worthy of the gifts that God has given me in that other sense of have I given what I have, in full measure, what I have been given, or have I been holding it back? You can ask that question, but that question is only... Pra the only practical aspect to this question is not have I been worthy of it, but can I be any more worthy of it than I have been so far? That is to say, is there any more that I can give? Is there any better that I can do? Or to phrase it another way, how can I be worthy of what I have been given? Because if you've been given it and you haven't given it yet, you can still give it. And so you can become worthy of it at any moment. You can, you can, whenever you've been given, 
give. Even if you've not given it first, you can then give later. And so in this sense, how can you be worthy of what God has given you? Um, this is... I'll get to the interaction with depression in one second. Hopefully it'll be fairly obvious. Um, or it's already fairly obvious, I mean. But this is just a question of how can I give what I have been given? What is there that I've been given that I have now the ability to give to somebody else? Or to somebody's else? Now, uh, this is where we get the interesting question of depression. Because depression does tend to make you sort of concentrate your focus down on some small thing. It makes it very hard to give. Now, uh, there are two very relevant things to do here. Um, one of them is in this circumstance when you're depressed, one of the things to ask yourself is to look around, even though I feel horrible and can barely think, is there any way in which I can force myself to think about something, even if it's small, that is still a little bit more than I've thought of so far? Is there anything I can do for a person where for a few moments I can forget what I have such trouble forgetting, and just do something for somebody else. So that's one of, the, one of the things. And the other of the things is the importance of realizing that there are a lot of things in this world it may look like we have been given to give to others that we haven't. And in fact, a great deal of immorality comes from trying to snatch at things that we think we have been given. Um, you know, one of the great uh, examples comes from murder mysteries. Um, for various reasons, people tend to snatch for themselves, but occasionally you'll see the murder mystery wherein somebody murders somebody for somebody else's benefit. So uh, usually you'll see like a devoted lover and there's, a, you know, and the, the person they love really wants to go do something else. And so in order to free them up to go do it, the person goes and murders the, the other person standing in their way. And they don't expect to get anything out of it, um, but they just want to give to this person, and they are murdering in order to do it. And that's a really good example of a thing which the person was not actually given to give. They are snatching at some good which has not been given to them to give, and trying to give it, and that is what makes what they're doing immoral, is the fact that they weren't given to give it. So, um, the, in the, t the, the thing this has to do with depression is that it is sometimes the case that the work that God has given you to do is more contracted than you think it is. It may be that your primary thing you need to do at the moment is just figure out how the heck you get a job or something like that. So it may be that you have not been given, there may be a lot of things you have not been given to give to others right now, even though in some sense, some other person who did not have the same problems, the same gifts, the same limitations, etc., as you would be able to give this thing but they're not you. You're you. And so you do need to be realistic about what you have been given to give. That counterbalances, you also need to be realistic when you are depressed about what you can not do You can do and you can't do. And there is an element um, in which, uh, that also pertains to depression, which is sometimes in depression, one is focusing too much on the thing. And there are things you have in fact been given to give. And what you need to do in the moment is to work on regaining a proper sense of perspective. And uh, to use another story, there's another time later on in my life, but oh, I want to say it was like seven, eight years later, um, working at a small company, there um, we had a, uh, a product that um, we ceased to be able to get parts for. And we had to, I'm a programmer, software programmer. And we needed to, um, and as, as the... Um, you know, I was basically the, the only programmer available for um, here. And so we needed to be able to um, move to using a different chip on the, the thing that we made. And we were going to run out and I don't remember the specifics. It was something like two months or three months. We we're going to just run out of the previous chip and cease to be able to make things. And if I couldn't get the software working with this new chip in time, we would not have a product. This was a display chip, it was a display component um, that was working terribly. Um, and um, and so if I couldn't get it working, you couldn't use the, the thing at all, because if, if the person can't see anything, you can't do anything with that, at which point we wouldn't have a product to sell and the entire company could go under. 
And the problem is that the time frame involved was such that by the time you could bring other people up to speed on getting this sort of thing done, you wouldn't really be able to do it anyway. Like, it would take so long to get up to speed, they wouldn't be useful for such a long time. And so, um, I mean, I did have a lot of long nights, but at the same time, it was, you know, this, the threat of being unemployed again, um, you know, was very much there. And not just me, but, like, everybody could be unemployed if I didn't do my job well enough. And that was a really, really very stressful thing. And it was the sort of thing that was very easy to think about and kind of difficult to not think about. But um, one of the benefits of being older and wiser at the time than, um, than, than back at first um, in the previous thing was that I spent a lot of time thinking about the fact that this life is not only temporary, but that suffering is a part of this life. And we don't know what it is God has given us to do. And some of the time we think that God has given us to do things like to um, you know, provide for people to, um, you know, to, to, uh, you know, to work at our avocation, you know, like a job, a career, etc. To, to do that sort of thing, to be that sort of part of society. And, you know, that, that is a way in which you benefit people. It's a way in which you give some of what you've been given. But it's not necessarily the case. It, it isn't. At any moment, it's possible that, like, that was what we'd been given up to this point, and now what we've been given is to... Um, is to be homeless, to be wandering the streets, hungry and homeless, and unable to care for other people, and you know, barely able to care for oneself. And that's possible. Like, that is not outside the realm of possibility. It's not statistically highly likely in America at this point. Uh, at this point in history, statistically, most people um, of working age are employed. But not everyone, and uh, not necessarily me. And so... To face, come face to face with this, and in some sense this is actually a little bit related to my video about how not to be afraid of the dark, but to really come and look at this and say, like, yes, that is in fact the case. Maybe everything will go terribly. Maybe that's God's will that this doesn't work out in this circumstance. Maybe it's God's will that I, I cease to be able to be a, a you know, provider to, to my wife and children. Maybe we actually have, you know, maybe we've only been given... You know, at the time, 30 some odd, you know, I've only been given 30 some odd years. And then my time on this earth is over. Could be. I don't know. And coming face to face with that and really forcing myself to look at that. In, in the midst of my stress, this is a thing I didn't want to look at. But I forced myself, you know, to turn my face and look at the fact that this is genuinely possible. And... That actually really tremendously helped. Uh, there's actually, um, there's a G.K. Chesterton, Father Brown story. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's like the Book of Doom or something like that. In, in which there's this uh, book that supposedly makes anybody who reads from it disappear. Um, and, uh, um, and Father Brown mentioned, uh, at, at the end, it, it, this turned out, um, there, there's an explanation to it. And, um, and somebody said, uh, you know, Father Brown, but didn't you ever, for a moment feel just the the awfulness of, of this book and father brown said no uh, first thing i did is i went and looked inside and saw that the pages were all blank and uh, and then he said and this is the thing about mystic this is the thing if anybody ever tells you not to look at something look at it that's the thing you should go and look at that life should not be lived in fear and i, I wish i actually looked up that i didn't know i was going to talk about that so i wish i had looked up that selection uh, my father the, the Right there is the complete Father Brown on my bookshelf. Um, I really wish I had looked that up. But anyway, um, but yeah, and that actually turns out to be true. Like, whenever you're afraid, fear is telling you to not look at something. And that's the thing to go look at. The thing to face down, because when you actually look at it for real, it largely, though not completely by any means, loses its power over you. And this is the thing, um, when you are in a continually stressful situation, you have to constantly go back and look at it again. You know, it's not just like, look at it for, you know, in the face for a moment, and then you're fine ever after. You'll you know, keep having to go back. Same reason, frankly, that we have to go to church every Sunday, or even every day, because we forget the truth. And we have to be reminded of the truth. This, this world tends to make us forget what is true. But so that is something that I found extremely helpful. And I did not become... 
it, it would have been very easy for me to become depressed. And I could feel myself occasionally slipping in that way. I was putting in a lot of long nights. Um, but at the same time, I was also, by the grace of God, managing to keep some perspective on the thing and not slip into depression there as I had previously, in part because I went and really faced the worst of what could happen. And when you face the worst of what can happen and, and, and you know, really come face to face with the fact that like, maybe God has only given me however long I've been given so far plus one day. And if so, I would still have been given a gift. That would still be good. And then after this, I move on to eternity afterwards. But however long I've been given, it's good, even though it's not, you know, even were it to stop three minutes from now, it would still be good. It would not cease to, what has already happened would not cease to be good merely because it stops at, you know, this point, when I knew it would stop at some point, and it will be good, that is to say, you know, better than nothing in that sense, because, you know, the alternative to existence is non-existence, and God gives to us existence. God gives it to us all of these things, um, all of the goodness to perceive, all of the goodness to do, all the good I had been given to do up to this point in my life, I would not have retroactively not have done because I'm not given any more good to do after a certain point. And so, this, I think, is roughly speaking the key to this sort of thing. I mean, if, if you have simply a chemical imbalance that makes it impossible for you to think straight, then, well, this is across the bear in the same way that a man with no arms can't pick anything up. And so picking things up has not been given to a man with no arms. In like way, if you cannot think straight because of a chemical imbalance or something like that, well, then these are things that may look like they've been given to you because things like them have been given to other people who are like you, except not in this relevant way. But, well, they haven't been given to you. And so there the, the cross to bear is learning to not hanker after things that have not been given to you. But if you have that other kind of depression, or one of the other kinds of depression, that involve um, focusing too much on something that you should only pay a lot of attention to, but not exclusive attention to, if you have that kind of depression, then the thing to do there is the focusing on the truth of the situation, of facing down exactly how bad it can be, and coming to terms with it's not as good as you would hope for, but it is still a positive good. It's, your life is still a net a, a net benefit to you. There still have been things you have been given to do, and those remain good, no matter how much you may not be given in the future. And this can really help you. This, you know, and a lot of prayer. Um, it, curiously, to some degree, focusing on this stuff is more or less praying. So uh, there's kind of a coincidence, or not a coincidence there, I suppose. Um, but so that, I think, is, in a practical sense, the thing to do if this is the sort of depression that you, that you suffer from, is that sort of focus, that sort of learning to center yourself, to focus on the truth of the temporariness of this world, and that the temporariness of this world does not eliminate the, the good that has already been a part of it, nor does it eliminate whatever goods you still are given to do. And when you face that, the power that this fear has over you diminishes and you will be able to give some of that good that you have been given to give, at which point you will be doing, you will be accepting that gift that God has given you. So, um, that basically is the practical side of it. And I don't know how much of the, I mean, to some degree I sort of implicitly covered a lot of the intellectual side of it. Um, just very briefly, though, um, it, in case the intellectual side of the problem of suffering, how can God be omnipotent and all good and there be suffering in the world? Um, the short version of this, I've, I've talked about it a bit. Um, I've got a video about how good and evil are asymmetric. Um, so it's the one that has like a good and then evil as a shadow coming off of the letters good, um, it, which is very intentionally chosen because evil... And the key to this is that evil is a privation. Evil does not have a positive existence. Evil is rather the absence of good. Evil is like a shadow, because a shadow is not a real thing. A shadow is the absence of light. A shadow is simply where there is light around it, but there isn't light there because something is blocking the light and keeping the light from reaching there. So a shadow looks real, 
but isn't. And therefore, evil does not, evil is not, you know, we, we uh, learned the, the, the number line, right? There's zero and there's positive one and minus one. If you add positive one to minus one, you get zero. Well, the thing is, evil is not like negative one. There can't be negative three evil, so if you have three good and negative three evil, it works out to be equivalent to not having done anything. Evil is always, in fact, a zero. So you could add three and three and zero, and you get six. And we feel the evil because we see the pattern. Plus three, plus three, the next one should be plus three, but instead it's plus zero. Well, you're still at six, you're not at three. Plus three, plus three, plus zero, plus zero, leaves you still at six. It doesn't bring you back to zero. Plus three, plus three, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, still leaves you at plus six. It doesn't bring you back to negative three. And that, intellectually speaking, is the key to this, because when God permits evil to exist, he is permitting there to be the lack, he is permitting the lack of being. But, that is, you have to remember the default state of things. And so permitting there to be some amount of lack of being that a person, ha he, so evil is always done in this case, um, in cases where we intermediate good for each other. Because there are always there's two kinds of good that God gives us. Direct gift. So everything receives the direct gift of existence from God in the moment. So um, as you may recall, the uh, in the problem of um, contingency and necessity, where we're all contingent and we don't have to exist because there are times when we didn't exist and there will be times when we don't exist and therefore our existence is not necessary. It's contingent and contingent on something else. If that thing is contingent, then both of us are contingent yet on something else and so on. Until, not temporally, by the way. It's, it's, think that, you know, if time's marching on this way, it's this way. Like, why do I exist? Well, you know, I'm made of these atoms, but why did they exist? And so on. Um, and you get to, like, you know, eventually you can push it down to subatomic particles. Like, well, why do these subatomic particles exist? And then at this point, within science, you just throw up your hands. Um, but this, they must then depend upon something else, because those subatomic particles don't have to exist either. And so, this is where we come to God. We all depend in the moment on God. The argument for motion, by the way, also has that same property. Why is there, you know, change? Change can only be actualized by something actual. And this is not at the beginning of time, but as one moment turns into the next moment, what the heck is there that makes the one moment turn into the other moment? Because the previous moment can't contain the next moment. Otherwise, if the previous moment contained the next moment, they would be there simultaneously with each other. So it doesn't contain the next moment. And so the actuality of the next moment can't come from the previous moment. It's got to come from something else. And again, if that thing doesn't have it, you, you just throw back the, the infinite... Um, the infinite recursion. If there's nothing that has actuality, then none of these things are actual, and well, then they wouldn't be there. They're here, therefore there must be something actual in this chain that is turning one moment into another moment. And so that, that's why people get a little bit confused with, like, like, they try to talk about, like, the Big Bang, and that's irrelevant. The argument for motion has nothing to do, nothing important to do with the Big Bang. The argument for motion has to do with how does one moment turn into the next? Uh, motion, by the way, meaning change. Um, uh, for some reason, local motion, that is to say the change in location, um, somehow got the term, just sort of devolved into the term motion, um, which is um, it's just sort of a linguistic quirk. It's the argument from change is really what that argument is. Both of these things point to the same thing, that God stands outside of all the moments, direct, directly actualizing the moments, making them real, giving them existence. And so in that, God directly gives to everything that exists within the moment. And we exist in each moment because of that direct gift of God. There's also um, dependence on the previous moments. And so God's gift also filters through creation as well. So God creates us in the primary sense, but also in a secondary sense, because God gives it to us to take part in his act of creation. So uh, a husband and a wife come together and they make a child. And so the child exists because of God's direct action, maintaining any of this stuff in existence at all. Um, also in not only maintaining that child in existence, where the, nothing would exist without God, but also having you know, making the parents, but the parents are allowed to be part of this chain of causation, it's a technical term for being secondary causation. 
And so, um, within this, there is the direct action, God maintaining um, in existence, but there is also the indirect action of God, wherein he gives it to us to be part of his action. And the same thing applies, by the way, like if you teach anybody anything, you are part of the act of creating them. They teach you, they are part of the act of creating you, of the creation of this of you with this knowledge they are taking part in, and so the intermediate. So when we talk about evil, what we're always talking about is the interruption of the secondary causation. It has been given to you to do something for another person. It has been given to you, and in general it is given to us, by the way, to arrange the world in such a way that we all like live within it. So um, this is part of, we don't normally talk about this because, or even think about it, because the complexity of everyone maintaining the organization of the world in a way that works for us all is so complex we can't really pay attention to it. But it is not so complex for God. And so God very actively um, thinks of it, because God very actively thinks of absolutely everything. So, um, evil is an interruption of the secondary causation. It is not giving what the person has been given to give to another. And so, evil is always an interruption of secondary causation. It's only in the interaction uh, between each other. And so, the relevant thing, and this is again on the purely intellectual basis, is when, a, when God is going to give something to a person and gives it to a second person, another person to intermediate that, and that person refuses to do that and does not intermediate this, and so does not give that benefit to that person. That person is, in a strict sense, not worse off. They are no better off, and they should have been better off, but they aren't worse off. And so, and again, I want to be clear, I'm talking about on the, um, uh, on the intellectual level. Like, we suffer, we don't like suffering, but suffering is actually just the, the perception of privation. Um, suffering is essentially like seeing a shadow. It is recognizing that there is something that should be there that isn't. But the fact that there is something there that shouldn't, it is not, something is not there that should be there, does not take away what is, in fact, there. We, being fallen, have a tendency to forget that and to exaggerate the problem because we pay so much attention to the privation, we forget what is not privated. And we forget that the person is not, in a strict sense, worse off. We have expectations, and our expectations get thwarted. And we count this against the world, but properly speaking, the world isn't worse off for these things. The world is only failing to be better. And so, and again, as I want to emphasize, I'm talking, because it's very easy to sort of emotionally charge this, I'm talking in a purely intellectual sense that um, evil, since evil is a privation, evil doesn't actually exist, it is not contradictory to God being all-powerful and all-good that God is permitting something to not be given in the moment because this is not taking away anything that God has created. It is not uncreating anything. It is simply failing to take part in the creation of something more. And so God is not being thwarted in the sense of anything that God has done being undone, anything that God has made being unmade. It is possible that something that God has made ceases to be made anymore, where God has given somebody the option, has given it to somebody to continue this act of creation, and they haven't. But there is nothing positive that takes away from it. The, the creation does not in any way diminish, it just fails to increase in a way that we expect it to. Now, uh, something that should be borne in mind is it is very frequently the case that the, um, that what is not given by one is often given by another, that where a person fails to teach somebody something that they should have taught them, they learn it in some other means. That frequently does happen in life. Um, that somebody is not given food in one way, but they do get food in another, and so on. Um, this is, it is all, it is very frequently the case that things that were supposed to be intermediated by one person but aren't get intermediated by something else. Um, the other thing, of course, is the thing I had mentioned much earlier, um, uh, intellectually speaking, that we can't tell when a thing is you know, how much life a person was supposed to have been given anyway. And so it may in fact be the case that a person was, um, 
not in fact is supposed to receive more moments than they actually received. And because of the bad choices of another person, the way in which this was accomplished was different than it should have been. Um, but in any event, um, that, that's a sort of more complicated speculation. But that again is a possibility that has to be borne in mind when you're considering this purely in the intellectual dimension of the thing. Um, and again, not an excuse for the person who is doing wrong. But, um, so that is sort of the intellectual side of things. Like, you know, how is that the case? And, you know, that carries through within, um, you know, within something like depression, where a person may not be, you know, for, for various reasons, you know, there are things that they may not have been given. And we see, we feel the lack of this because we are used to the normal shape of things and where we see something missing, we feel that. We, we feel that there is some sort of privation present, um, but we don't see everything. It's important to bear in mind, we have a very finite perspective. So that's where we go wrong in thinking that there is some sort of positive evil which has happened that takes away from the um, that takes away from the good that has actually been accomplished. But in a strict sense, it hasn't, and that is, in fact, the answer. Um, it doesn't answer the emotional side of it, clearly. That's why I've been careful to label this as, as just addressing the intellectual side. Um, and as I said, I saved this for the end because I really think um, that that was not, it was really not the intellectual side of it that, that was being asked about. But because somebody might not have encountered the intellectual answer to the problem of suffering before, uh, that's where it comes from. As, as I said, I, I do also recommend recommend my video on um, uh, good and evil are asymmetrical. It's the one, uh, as I said, it's the thumbnail's got the word good, and then evil is a shadow coming off of it. Which you can see why I chose to do it that way. So, um, I hope that this helps, and uh, until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.